special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Why did God favor Israel over all the other nations? Because he chose to. The Lord, verse 7, did not set his love upon you nor choose you because ye were more in number than any people for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath he had sworn to your fathers hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh king of Egypt. God says he did not set his love on Israel because of anything they did or what they were but because he loved them. He chose to love that nation. That's his prerogative. You see God can do anything he wants to do and he never does anything that isn't right. He loved us when we were loveless. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. What was there in me that could merit esteem or give the Creator delight? Twas even so, Father, I must ever sing because it seemed good in Thy sight. God chose to save me because that's what he wanted to do. He didn't have to. He didn't owe it to me. But he chose to. And oh, how I rejoice in that discriminating, sovereign love of God that sets its affection on those that Jesus died for. Number 10, it is irresistible in its objects. When God sets his love and choice upon an individual, they will come to Jesus. Because the love of God is irresistible. Every person that's ever been saved has been saved by a divine call. God called me that night he saved me. And if you're saved, he called you. It may have been by the Bible. It may have been by hearing a preacher. But whatever it was, there was a divine call that came to your heart. And you responded to that call. Why did you? You're depraved, lost, undone in your mind by wicked works, the Bible says. Yet you responded. Why did you respond? Because God put it in your heart to respond. And if he had not, you would not have responded. That's why the Bible says salvation is not of him that willeth. See, you're willing to be saved had to come from God because it's not in the heart of man to will. If God left us alone, not one of us would ever be saved because there's nothing in the depraved heart of man that desires God. And if the desire is placed there in the heart, it's because God placed it there. Salvation is of the Lord, Jonah said. It is also irresistible to its objects. And we have a promise in John 6.37 that all those that God chose are going to come. Listen to it. All that the Father giveth me, Jesus said, shall come to me. And him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. Now that's a wonderful verse. All of those that the Father gave to Jesus, that's the people that are saved, will come to Him. They'll come to Jesus. And those that come, He will not cast out. So I can preach to you this morning that if you're not saved and you come to Jesus in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, if you come to Him, if you believe the gospel, if you trust Him, then I can assure you that you were chosen of Him. And that's why you come to Him. Again, salvation is of the Lord. For whom He did, all, for whom he did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed in the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate them he also called, 
and whom he called, then he also justified, and whom he justified, then he also glorified. God guarantees our salvation. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Nobody can take you away from Jesus. A man said to me one day, I know that the Bible says nobody can take us out of the Father's hand, but we could just walk out of the Father's hand. I said, you couldn't any more walk out of His hand than you could walk into His hand. You can't just walk into His hand. He has to put you in His hands. And once He puts you in His hands, you can't walk out. And I've never met anybody that wanted to walk out. And I never will. Nobody ever wanted to leave Jesus once he knows him. Now there are those that have professed to be Christians and then later walked away. They were never saved. They were just professors. We have a lot of professors in the world that profess Jesus' name, but they're not possessors. They don't have the love of God in their heart. They've never been born again. And so I have to close. Our time is running out here. It's immutable in its steadfastness. It never varies. There isn't anything you can do to change God's love for you. Now in the human family, if my son disobeyed me, my feelings toward him would change. I'd still love him, but I wouldn't have the same uh, good feelings toward him that I had before. But God, his love never changes. You say, what if I went out and got drunk tomorrow? God wouldn't love me then. Yes, He would. If you're a child of God, if you're born again, He would still love you. But you know what He would do with you? He'd take you to the woodshed. You know. And He takes all of us to the woodshed. I've been there. I, I know the woodshed. You see, the Bible says, Whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth that they might not be condemned with the world. God won't let His people live in sin, and His people don't. Once in a while, they can fall into sin. A sheep can fall into a mud hole, but he'll get back out because it's not his nature to wallow in the mud. Now, a hog will go look for a mud hole to wallow in because that's his nature. You can take a pig and put a pink ribbon around his neck and put him on a satin pillow in your bed, in your bedroom, and he'd still be a dirty pig. And as soon as you open the door, he'd bolt for the door and run look for a mud hole. That's the unsaved. But a sheep, if he falls into a mud hole, he's not comfortable there. He'll get out. He won't stay there. And we're God's sheep. We're not his hogs. We're his sheep. And it's immutable in his steadfastness. His love does not change. No matter what you do or what you fail to do, God still loves you. If he ever loved you, he still loves you. And he will always love you. And that's not an encouragement to sin. Our opponents say, well, that's an encouragement to sin. I can just go out and sin all I want to. I'm like the old fellow says, does you sin all you wants to? He said, I sin more than I want to. That's God's speaking. We don't want to, but sometimes we do. As often as we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's everlasting in its duration. It has no end. His love no end nor measure knows. No change can turn its course. Eventually, eternally, the same it flows from one eternal source. God is immutable. And that's a word that means unchangeable. He never changes. He never changes His attitude towards you. He never changes His love towards you. What does the love of God mean to a serving believer? The love of Christ constrains us. Because we judge if one died for all, then all were dead. 
What does the love of God mean to a sorrowing believer? It means comfort. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. What does the love of God mean to a sinning believer? Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. When God takes you to the woodshed, it's a mark of his love. I've raised four children. And they like to play with our neighbor children. And I told my children, if I catch you playing out in the street again, I'm going to punish you. And I'd come home and I'd find them playing out in the street. You know what I did? I punished them. And the neighbor kids were playing out in the street too. Did I punish the neighbor's kids? No, I never touched them. You know why? They weren't my kids. I punished my kids. I didn't punish my neighbor's kids. And God chastises his people when they sin, but he doesn't chastise the world because they're not his. One last thing. What does the love of God mean to a suffering believer? It means reward. You know, Christians don't have much in this world. We don't have much of the world's goods. And we we don't have any of the world's love. The world hates us. But someday, God's going to change all of that. There's going to be a reward given to His people. And the Bible says if we suffer with Him, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. Now, if we suffer, we'll reign with Him. Jesus is coming back. We're going to reign with Him on this earth. And He will make us to rule and reign with Him over this world. What a reward He has for us who serve Him. Now I close. Do you know the love of God? Has it ever been shed abroad in your heart? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? If not, right now, you can accept His love. Believe on Him. Trust Him. And you'll find that if you do that, it's because you're one of those that He chose before the world was to be His own. That's what the Bible teaches from Genesis to Revelation. You'll not hear it preached much in many churches. I preach it because it's in the Bible. I preach it because it's true. The doctrine of election is found over 57 times in the New Testament. And yet, the world hates that doctrine. But Christians love it because it, in it they see their security. They see the motivation that was brought about in their salvation. It gives them a firm foundation on which to stand on the shifting sands of human emotions. They know that it was God who did it for them. We are going to close in prayer. We'll go down and eat at the dining room. And uh, we have a man with us this morning that needs a little financial help. And uh, he has asked if uh, we might be able to help him. And uh, so this gentleman over here, if you'd like to give something to him to help him out, he needs a little money to pay his uh, rent. Uh, you can do that as you go by. And uh, we'll go down and eat. And let's pray and we'll ask God's blessing on the food right now. And then we don't have to do it at the table. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so grateful today that you loved us before time began and that you set that love upon us. You refused to allow us to go in our wayward course. You halted our wayward path and intercepted us and brought us to yourself. We're so grateful for this love that you shed abroad in your people. And we all recognize it in each other. And we thank Thee for it this morning. We ask Thee to bless the food as we partake of it and that we might have a good time of fellowship around the table this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.